I'm Carol Reynolds, and I am delighted to be able to speak with the soloist for this upcoming concert of the Dallas Winds, Laura Bennett Cameron, Dr. Laura Bennett Cameron, if I will put it in your academic title, but that's not what brings us together today. What brings us is that wonderful instrument. Uh, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to talk with you. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. And, you know, I, uh, a, a musician wears so many hats on a daily or on a weekly basis. It's nice sometimes to take off of my take off my academic hat and put on my soloist hat and just be Laura Bennett Cameron. And so I'm glad the bassoon could bring us together. Well, absolutely. And the bassoon is the bassoon no matter what. And listen, there's a lot of people out there, I'm sure you know this, who have no idea what a bassoon even is, much less how a lovely woman like you comes to be a bassoon soloist and part of all these ensembles playing the bassoon. So what is, many things I could ask you, but how in the world did you and this instrument get to know each other? Well, you know, it's a funny thing, um, but first I'll take a, a quick tour of the instrument, um, which is a funny thing to do on Zoom because it's a big instrument and a tiny frame, but this is the bassoon. If we were to uncoil it, it would be about nine feet long from the tip of the reed, which is which is right here. You'll have to follow me. So here's the tip of the reed, and the air goes from here down here. It turns around here, and then it comes out all the way up here. So it's quite a long trip for the air. Um, so the bassoon is an instrument, not surprisingly, that not a lot of sixth graders look at and say, oh, that looks like fun. They look at the saxophone and the trumpet and they say that looks like more fun, which is exactly what I did. Um, so I was in the fifth grade um, because back in uh, DISD, they started kids in the fifth grade back then. Um, and Bill Clinton was president, not to date myself. And I thought the saxophone was the coolest thing there was. And I wanted to play the sax. And so I played the sax. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I was okay. I was okay at the saxophone. I could have been better. Um, I practiced, um, you know, and then I got to, to the end of seventh grade and my band director said, um, hi, Mr. Deaver, if you're watching, um, he said, Laura, we have too many saxophones and no bassoons. Do you want to switch to bassoon? And I thought to myself, when we listen to WRR, my mom says, oh, what a pretty bassoon. So I thought I should play the bassoon. My mom likes it. And so I switched and I never looked back. Um, and within just a couple of weeks, when I played like a medium low note on the instrument, I fell completely and rapturously in love. And any plans I had for my life at the ripe age of 13 went completely out the window. And I decided 13 years old in my living room that I was going to be a professional bassoonist. And here I am. Oh my goodness. And what did your mom say when you came back with a bassoon? she was thrilled. She was absolutely thrilled. I come, I'm very fortunate to come from a musical family. My mom um, is an amateur, but wonderful um, singer and um, keyboardist. And she was, she raised us on really good classical recordings. And so all of our, all of our family, we all had some piano training. Uh, most of my sisters more than me, I was stubborn and gave up. Um, but we can all sing, um, we can all harmonize, we can all play some piano. And most of my older siblings also play a wind instrument as well, or have had uh, voice training. Oh, so. that, that's perfect. And you know, that used to be not such an unusual thing to say, but in, in our time, that is a special gift. It is. And I, I just can't thank my mother enough for giving all of us that special gift, that appreciation of music and that drive to pursue it. Okay. Well, what did you fall in love with about the bassoon? It the low be, notes. I mean, it isn't easy to carry, right? It is not easy to carry. That was definitely not it. Um, it was the low notes. And the note in question wasn't even that low. It was, it was, I'll play it for you. So the, the note this is the question. note that got you, right? This was the one. This is the note. It's a nice note, right? But the bassoon goes. And it goes a whole octave lower than that. But just that one, that one B flat, it really hooks me and I was done. That is the love story of, of the night for sure. Yes. It is a love story. 
Well, it's a long way from playing a B flat to being able to play this marvelous and virtuosic piece by Weber that you will be doing as a featured soloist. Um, tell us about the piece and, and what it feels like to play it and do you love it as well? <laughs> oh my goodness. I, um, you know, I, I feel kind of sacrilegious saying that maybe, maybe our Mozart concerto isn't my favorite concerto. It's a beautiful piece. I love the Mozart concerto, but in terms of stage works, I actually do prefer um, the Andante and Rondo um, over the Mozart concerto in terms of stage performance. It's a little bit flashier um, and bassoonists will kill me for this, but I also prefer it over Weber's concerto and F for bassoon. Um, I just, I think this, this particular piece is so tuneful and I think it really showcases the range of the bassoon really, really beautifully. Um, and I think it has a lot for the audience and it offers a lot to the player and for the orchestra as well, because I think there are a lot of interpretive challenges. And that's something I'm really looking forward to digging in um, into with Jerry, because Jerry brings such an interpretive gift um, to the stage in the way that he coaxes new things out of each performance. Um, and the way he handles slow pieces and, and brings out those nuances each time um, is really beautiful. And so I'm just, I'm counting down the hours until I can stand next to Jerry on stage and play this piece. Oh, that is wonderful. And you know, I've heard that said over these many years that I've been privileged to work with this organization by a number of soloists on large and important pieces that those slow movements, which some people don't realize they are the challenge, with the combination of Jerry Junkin on the podium, that it's something magical. It, it really is. Um, you know, from my very first concert with Jerry, that's what I noticed is his ability um, to, to take, you know, 60 to 70 people and do something and unite us around a new idea in a moment. It's something we've never done before, but he's perfectly readable and followable, followable. And he can make us do something new and something unique and something that's really tangibly, emotionally beautiful that we've never quite done before. And it's really moving. It's really beautiful. Oh, I like that. And in this concert, in these unusual times that we've all been through, you won't have 70 players as you would ordinarily have for this concerto. So talk to us a little bit about what that's going to be like. You know, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's an, a unique challenge. And if musicians are anything, we are infinitely adaptable. You know, put us in a cold church with a flat organ. Fine, we can deal with it. Um, you know, put us outside on a windy day, we'll deal with it. So, you know, give us reduced ornamentation. We will adapt to the challenge with gusto, especially the Dallas winds. You know, we're a group that's thrived on changing times. Um, and I'm really excited to hear these pieces with, with unique instrumentation and things a little bit pared down. And I'm excited to tackle these pieces with some reduced or instrumentation and, and find some so maybe more intimate um, ways to interpret these with my with Jerry and my colleagues. Yeah, so the chamber music virtue that is often not known again. I keep coming back to this, but we're not around a lot of chamber music uh, in our era. We're not going to the salon on Sunday afternoons or Thursday mornings of the aristocratic whoever who has the string quintets and the trios in, you know, to fill the parlor with new poetry. I mean, we don't have that world anymore. And it's hard to hear music for reduced numbers. It is. It's, it's harder to find. It's true. Yeah. Well, now, it, what's the difference when you, you play with the ensemble and with many other ensembles and then you'll be playing solo? What, are those very different hats? Those are very different hats. Um, you know, sometimes the bassoon in, a, in an ensemble in the Dallas Winds or an orchestra does have solo lines. That's not uncommon at all. Um, but most of the time in an ensemble situation, the, the bassoon is a master blender. We play with the flutes, we play with the cellos, we play with the trombones, we have a cute bouncy line, we're holding down a pedal tone. Um, and so we have to be very flexible and ready for anything. Um, but it's very different as a soloist. Um, bassoonists make their own reeds. Um, so I should have had my reed set up here to show you. But this contraption I made by hand. Um, I took it from a tube. If you've ever seen that sort of um, uh, cane 
growing outside in bar ditches that you drive past and thought, oh man, that looks annoying. That bamboo looking stuff, that's what we make our reeds out of, um, except it grows really well in wine regions. So we tend to get it from Italy, <laughs> France, and South America. Um, and so I take it from that tube that you see growing on the side of the road and turn it into a bassoon reed. And so for this, um, one of the bigger challenges is the reed to make sure that I have a reed that is at once very, very delicate and also really powerful because I've got to be able to project and push over the ensemble all the way to the back of the hall. Um, but at the same time, it's got to be flexible enough to handle those quiet passages because the Meyerson is a beautiful hall um, and it can really allow me to to play into those small dynamics. And I know that Jerry and my colleagues will be ready for that too, for us to create some nice, small, intimate moments. Um, also a lot of practicing standing for me. Most bassoonists um, prefer to play seated all the time, whether they're soloing or whether they're in an ensemble. Um, but I personally prefer to play standing. I'm really comfortable that way. So it's just a change for me of how I practice. My goodness, there's so many things that go into it. I mean, you were talking about reeds. And, and that takes time, doesn't it? How much it takes time, a lot. How much time might it take to make the read that makes you happy? Oh my gosh, <laughs> months probably. Um, but it's it's a longer process than that, and so it's not. You know, when when Jerry first started talking to me about this opportunity, I didn't say, "Oh my gosh, I need a concerto read." It's more that I went to all of the tens of reads I've had in process for months, and I started thinking, "Okay." let's start looking at what we have going and let's start weeding things out and narrowing things down. And so when it comes to concerto week, the goal would be for me to have ideally, you know, five or six reads that I could say, okay, any of these should work. And that should, that should be what a bassoonist or an oboist has going on um, all, all the time so that they can have a read and a backup read and a backup backup read. Wow, that's amazing. And this instrument that you love so much from that one note has a very noble and long history. Can you take us back a little bit in time to, to its great, 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 great grandfather? Sure. Oh man, you've opened Pandora's box here. I can tuck your ear off about bassoon history for a long time. Um, uh, when I was getting my doctorate, I was taking a bassoon pedagogy course and we were required to write a summary of the bassoon's history, and I just couldn't do it. I turned in an eight page paper instead. <laughs> um, so the bassoon is actually one of the longest, um, one of the oldest instruments. Uh, the bassoon and the oboe, the double reed instruments are really old and they're much older than the clarinet. Um, forms of the flute, whether they're, um, you know, forward like this or they're transverse like our modern flute, they've been around for a long time too, as have percussion instruments. Um, but the bassoon in its kind of bent around form dates all the way back to the 1400s. Back then they would call it the Dulcian. Um, and then it went through a lot of different transformations. They started referring to it as bassoon or fagotto, um, which in its various translation means a bundle of sticks. As you can see, the bassoon is made of two sticks put together, and that's why it's called a bundle of sticks. Um, and so it's, it's been with us for a really long time. And so the bassoon has been a staple of musical history for a really long time, longer than the clarinet, longer than a lot of things. Um, and so, you know, I've got my trusty steed here, you know, trusted by musicians since the 13th century and I'm ready to go. <laughs> yeah. There you go. And then composers who do turn to it are pretty special as well. I mean, not every composer does turn to it as a solo instrument, right? It's very, very true. And it would be worth pointing out at this juncture um, <laughs> that the Andante and Rondo was not written for the bassoon. Mm. It was actually written for the viola. Insert viola joke here, but I won't because I adore every violist I know and they're all very talented and wonderful people. Um, and they've all been very gracious about us stealing this. Now, um, Weber himself did arrange it um, for a friend of his who was a bassoonist. So it's not like we just stole it. Weber himself did arrange it, um, but um, it works really, really well for the bassoon. Um, and it's almost as if he had written it for bassoon because the challenges for viola and bassoon are really similar. Um, in terms of range, it involves a unique um, technique for, that most bassoonists employ um, called triple tonguing. Um, otherwise, bassoonists might just slur a lot, which means they might not involve the tongue on so many notes. Um, 
but I like it flashy. So I'm throwing in more articulations, which means instead of just going ta, 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 I'm choosing to go ta, ka, ta, ta, ka, ta, ta, ka, ta, really, really fast. Whoa. And that reed better be able to handle it, right? Yes. And it, I'm so glad you pointed that out. Not every reed can handle um, double or triple tonguing. That's true. Okay. Well, it's going to be a big night uh, at the Dallas Winds, even with things that have been difficult to overcome, the numbers, the arranging, the spacing, but the music goes on, doesn't it? It does. I don't think there's anything you could do to us that would make us stop. You know, even when we weren't physically together at the beginning of the COVID period, we were still making music. As you mentioned, you know, my husband and I put on a recital with what we had in our house and a lot of other musicians did the same and the Dallas Winds pulled together and did musicians recitals from home and in the spaces we could access and nothing could make the music stop for the Dallas Winds. That is a great statement. And on that statement, I'm going to thank you very much and urge everyone who can possibly be at this concert to hear it live, but it will also be available in a streamed form and can be accessed thereafter for a while. So your outreach will be quite large, won't it? I'm, yes, I'm very excited about it. Well, and so is the bassoon. I can just see it. I just, just, just it's quivering with excitement. Right? It is. It is. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Laura. It's been a, a pleasure and I look forward very much to that music, which never stops. Thank you so much, Carol. It was really a pleasure. Thank you.